Thanks, Julie. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, and I can't, let's see, with my presenter screen, I can't see your faces, and I have no idea how many people are on here. So if you have uh, questions, you know, don't hesitate to unmute yourself and just holler out in the middle of my talk. Um, if you wave or something, I won't be able to see you. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to treat this like a like a pretty informal seminar, uh, which is nice. Um, yeah. So, like Julie said, I've I've done small angle neutron scattering um, in my past life, and this is the first presentation I've ever actually given on this. So it's been kind of fun. I was telling Julie, it reminds me of my bittersweet memories from uh, grad school um, and how hard grad school was and then how fun it was at the same time. So um, I give, you know, given that Julie has given some a background on, on scattering and a few other speakers have, have as well, I thought I'd, I'd give more of a, just a practical um, seminar describing to you what my experience was like during my PhD um, and just walking you through um, one particular example uh, of a problem that we worked on. And so this is uh, the PhD group uh, that I was in at UCLA. Um, let me see if I can get my pointer to work. Uh, this is uh, Tom Mason, my PhD advisor, who's still there in chemistry. Um, he's a great guy. He came out of Exxon and did a lot of neutron scattering at Exxon. Connie Cheng, who a lot of you know, she's an assistant professor here at MSU. We were in the same PhD group. And then Sarah Graves uh, was another one of the core folks who worked on this. She's uh, an associate professor at Pierce College in LA. Um, and so there are a few other people involved, but this was the main core group that did these experiments. Um, so the, the, the topic, one of the topics that I was working on as a PhD student were these systems called nano emulsions. And so these are oil and water emulsions um, and they have really unique and interesting properties. And this was um, a research area that we studied in the group. And um, so, so the two uh, samples that I'm showing you here in this picture, this is the one on the left is, they're both the same composition. So they're silicon oil in water, uh, droplets are stabilized with SDS surfactant, which is a um, um, electrostatically charged surfactant. Um, the one on the left, the drops are several uh, microns in size. And the one on the right, the drops are um, about 22 nanometers is the average uh, um, radius. So about 40 nanometers in, in diameter. And the neat thing that you see just immediately is that, um, you know, they're tr optically transparent. Um, so this is one, one of the cool properties about nano emulsions. Uh, you know, you, you get them so small, you make them so small that you can't, um, that they don't scatter light, which is neat. But they have a whole variety of other interesting properties and they're being used now as um, for drug delivery and um, all sorts of things. Um, so I want to give you a bit of a background in, in how to make these things. So if any of you have made mayonnaise or um, uh, salad dressing or something before, you know how to do this. So you take oil, you take, uh, and you want to integrate that oil into the water. Uh, you need to add some surfactant to this. So this is, you know, some of the best surfactants are uh, electrostatic uh, charged surfactants. And you apply shear, so you get these drops that form. Uh, those drops are prevented from coalescing because of the surfactant that, that resides on the interface of the drops. So you essentially have, you know, colloidal particles now or drops that you, um, that, that repel each other and, um, and, and don't coalesce. And the more shear that you apply, the smaller you can make those drops. And so this is this is pretty common. Um, I think most of you are probably familiar with this. Um, if you want to make really tiny drops, um, you need to apply intuitively. You know, you just need to shear the material quite a bit more. And um, so GI Taylor figured this out back in the 1930s. I think it was 1934. Um, basically, figured out the physics behind you know, making, making an emulsion. And the question is, if you have, you know, a drop of oil and water, um, what are the conditions that you need to, to take that drop and pinch it off into two smaller drops? And so what he did was he essentially balanced the viscous stress. So as you shear your, um, your, your emulsion, you are shearing um, the continuous phase, not, the, not so much the drop phase. And so there's a viscous stress that you're applying to the drop. That's a viscosity times a shear rate. And then he balanced that with the Laplace pressure. So this is the interfacial tension over the radius of the drop. 
And this is the condition at which your viscous stress is basically sufficient to um, overcome your Laplace pressure, the two are balanced. And, um, and this is a condition under which you, you can, you can um, um, break that drop up into smaller drops. And so what you see is that, um, you know, the si if you wanna make the drop a certain size, um, that size, um, the, the, the amount of shear that you need to apply goes as, as one over the uh, drop size. They're inversely proportional. So if you plug in some numbers, this is the viscosity of water, uh, interfacial tension, kind of a typical interfacial tension for um, SDS, silicon oil and water. And, um, and you apply a shear rate. This is a pretty high shear rate, but this, you can actually achieve this in like a kitchen blender. And um, you can see that you get drops then that are one micron in size. So if you want to go an order of magnitude smaller or two, two orders of magnitude smaller, you have to go one or two orders of magnitude higher in your shear rate. So the, um, the device that we used was a device that, that was developed for um, disrupting cells. So it's sold by a company in, in Massachusetts. And if you say, for example, if you're taking uh, bacteria and you're genetically modifying and using those bacteria to make something and you want to break those bacteria apart, you can use this, this machine to do this. So the basics of this machine is connected to an airline. There is a hydraulic air um, piston that's in here. Um, and, and the way that this works is that pressure builds up inside this, this uh, region here. It's actuated at a certain pressure. It drives a piston through here. Um, if you put your big emulsion drops in the top here, they're basically forced by the piston down through this, uh, through this uh, chamber right here. And within this chamber, this is a ceramic chamber that contains microfluidic channels. Um, and it's called a microfluidizer. This was developed a bit before, you know, uh, soft lithography drop microfluidics and everything came out. So they call it a microfluidizer. And within this, is, it essentially takes the, the, the emulsion, splits it into, into two streams, and then just drives those two, uh, impinges those two streams against each other. And so you, the shear that your drops experience is inhomogeneous in space and time, um, and, but the shear is extremely high. So what comes out are really tiny drops. Um, because it's inhomogeneous in space and time, you basically have to, have to cycle these through and pass them through multiple times. Um, and so typically five to 10 times you need to pass these drops through. Um, the, but you can get really tiny drops. So you can get drops that range in size from say five nanometers in, in radius or diameter to about a hundred nanometers. So you get really tiny drops, but they're polydispersed. Um, the other thing I'll note is that when you do this, the amount of mechanical energy that you're putting into your system is, is tremendous. So um, with the first pass, you feel the water, even though water has such a you know, high heat capacity, you feel the water warming up. And once you've run your sample through, say, five or 10 times, your water is at the point of boiling. Um, and so this actually limits, we would have to cool this whole thing down to, to um, um, because the heat actually messed with the drop coalescence and things like that. Um, so you make the, this is how we make these tiny drops. Um, once you get those, the, you have a, a poly dispersed uh, size distribution. So um, you have you know, a range of drops. And if you want to do model studies on things like this, then you want more mono dispersed drops. So the way that we would do that is we'd put them into a, a centrifuge tube. So this is an ultra centrifuge tube. You'd put a suspension in there. You would spin it, um, apply really large effective gravities to it. Uh, the oil is less dense than the water, so the, so the drops rise to the top. Um, the terminal velocity of a drop as it rises or settles um, goes as, um, what is it, the radius uh, squared. Um, and so large drops rise much faster than small drops. And so once you've done this, once you've centrifuged this, you get this little pellet at the top, it's clear. Big drops are on the top, small drops are on the bottom. You can pull that pellet out, cut it with a, with a butter knife essentially, resuspend it. So that's called fractionating. Um, and if you do this repeatedly, you can get really nice monodisperse um, um, drops. Uh, so monodisperse that they actually crystallize when you, um, um, when you pack them together, which is really monodisperse. So this is a TEM image uh, that uh, Connie Chang took, um, and this is just illustrating, you know, the size of the drops. These are relatively monodispersed, but we can get them, you know, even more monodispersed than that. So the, the drops themselves, I'll get to neutron scattering eventually. Um, the drops themselves are, uh, they interact, they're, they're charged on the surface, so they repel each other. Um, and so you can, um, if you wanted to describe what, the, um, what that repulsion is like, you can plot an interaction potential uh, U 
um, versus um, as a function of uh, separation between the drop centers. And, um, and so here you can see that this interaction potential is repulsive. Um, so, the, so the like charges repel each other. Um, the actual, if we were to, we, we could calculate the interaction potential. Typically you'd use something like DLVO theory that um, is the sum of uh, drop repulsion and um, Van der Waals attraction. And so you have these two components and they're, and they're, um, and you have, and you sum those up. Um, so this is under low salt con, uh, conditions. Uh, this would be the same, you know, as you, if you were to decrease the salt concentration, that device screen repulsion would become even um, more uh, pronounced uh, and the particles would be able to get less close to each other. But if you go in the opposite direction, you take salt, you dump a bunch of salt into your solution. What happens initially is that you get your device screen repulsion gets more and more screened out. So your particles are able to come close to one another. And if you add enough salt in there, um, the Van der Waals attraction ends up taking over um, and you get a, um, a secondary minima in this um, um, or minimum in the in your in your interaction potential. So I say secondary because there's another minimum up here. There's a potential energy uh, barrier and then down in here is the is the primary minimum. Um, and so the so the interesting thing about this is that you know typically if you were to take a drops and you put salt in there, you'd expect them to coalesce. You wouldn't expect them to really stick together very well. But for some reason, uh, really small drops do this. So you can get this potential energy well. That means that the particles stick to each other. Um, they don't coalesce. Um, they can still slip around each other. So they can they're slip they're interacting in a slippery way. Um, and the depth of that potential can be many times kT. So this means that thermal energy is not enough to to if you know if two particle two drops come together stick together. KT is not enough to, to actually break them apart and separate them into, into two individual drops. So this was the, um, the, the problem that we were interested in uh, in using neutron scattering was to um, look at the structures of these um, drop systems as we change the salt concentration. And we were specifically interested in the gels that these form. So um, in the case where you have a very low salt concentration and you were to pack particles together you can form a repulsive glass. Um, and so this happens, this is a kind of a totally different story, but this can happen at volume fractions much lower than uh, what you would typically expect for a glass. Um, and this is because the, the particles are so small, you have this, so the, so the red here is the, is the actual oil itself. And then the little white area around it is the re electrostatic, it represents the electrostatic repulsion. And when your drops get so small and you have so many of them, that little thin layer of electrostatic repulsion actually contributes to the effective volume of your um, of your system. So it's it's almost like you've added more oil um, than you have because of this this repulsion, and so you can get um, repulsive glasses at at volume fractions of like twenty five you know twenty five percent volume of oil and water. Um, but this is what I want to focus on is this attractive gel. So the attractive gel is what we we're interested in, in studying. Um, and so we did neutron scattering. So the particles are so small that you can't, uh, you can't use optical microscopy to look at them, right? And so you, we had to look for other systems. Um, small angle neutron scattering is an uh, excellent tool for doing this. So like any other um, scattering system, you have an incident beam. So you're shining, in this case, it's neutrons. Your sample is a nano emulsion um, here um, with some set path length. And then you scatter from, that from your sample and the way that you collect the data is that you have a you have a 2D detector and you get a scattering pattern on that 2D detector. And I'll explain how you then convert that to, that information on that 2D detector into uh, into an actual information that you can use. So, um, oh, just backing up a bit. So, so you get this um, uh, um, Q here is what you get, and um, so this is the scattering wave number. I uh, shamelessly stole this from my PhD dissertation. So this the scattering wave number is defined um, here, where it's you know um, you have this is your uh, wavelength of your of your neutrons. Uh, this is your scattering angle. Um, the important thing to just to take away from this is that when you combine this with with Bragg's law, um, you can get a relationship between Q, your scattering wave number, and the characteristic length scale that you're interested in. So if you if you if you when you when you get a, a scattering signature in your detector at a certain wave number, you can relate that back to a size. And so 
that characteristic length scale um, is just related as one over one over Q. Um, and there's a two pi in there as well. Um, but I'll bring this up again as we, um, so, so I, I can't really think in Q space, I think in like real space. So I always have to do this conversion as I'm, as I'm thinking about neutron scattering. Um, just to give you an idea of, of why, um, you know, why would you want to use neutrons instead of light? Um, X-rays are great. I've done X-ray scatter, scattering at, um, at Argonne. Um, but if, for, if, if I'm just thinking kind of in a, in a biased way for this particular system, um, you know, light versus uh, light uh, X-rays, um, which give you the, roughly the same information in the same kind of uh, for the same uh, structure for the same structure range as neutrons. In in light, you're scattering from differences in electron density. In neutrons, you're scattering from differences in neutron scattering length density, uh, not electron density. And so this means when you do your, if you want to optimize your contrast in your system, say you have a certain feature that you really want to, you want to pick out this feature and you want to, you want to scatter from that particular feature. If you want to do that with, with x-rays, you have to contrast, um, you need to put in some kind of contrast agent typically. I mean, sometimes you get lucky and you just get scattering from the feature that you're interested in, but this uh, requires um, high Z salts. And you can imagine based on what I told you about nanoemulsions, if you dump salts into the system, they're going to mess with your, with the, with the mess with your system. And so the neat thing about neutrons is that you can, you can use deuterated solvents. Um, in our case, we used uh, deuterated water, um, but, but there's a whole variety of deuterated solvents you can use. And the neat thing about that is that you don't change the chemistry um, of, your, um, of your system you, you know, by, by using these deuterated solvents. So you can, you can mess with the contrast without messing with the chemistry. And then the other nice thing is that when you're doing x-ray scattering, it's really hard to get absolute units. You have uh, parasitic scattering that occurs and, um, and that can be tricky to, to, um, to get around. The nice thing about neutrons is that you have uh, scattering in absolute units. So the, 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 the intensity of the scattering that you see is you know, directly proportional to, the, to the, scat the number of scatterers, the scattering density that's in your system. Um, and so that's nice for quantitative uh, experiments. Um, okay, so any questions so far? It's been a while since I've talked this long. If not, I'll keep going. No, okay. So the experiments that we did, there's a few different, um, or two different uh, beam lines in the US, uh, Oak Ridge that I'm aware of. I think Argonne has a small one um, there as well. Julie, you could correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. And then the one that we used back during my PhD was uh, at NIST at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, so it's just outside, um, for those of you who haven't been to the East Coast too much, just outside Washington, about uh, two hours from uh, Philly, which is where I grew up, and then you know two more hours to New York. Um, the, uh, it's on the NIST campus. So the NIST campus is, is actually quite nice. So it's this kind of, I don't know how big the campus is, but there's a lot of different labs there and a lot of green trees and uh, grass and running trails and things like this. Um, this is what the uh, Center for Neutron Research looks like, so NCNR. Um, and there's a, a nuclear uh, fission reactor right inside this little, little uh, area right here. And then all the beam lines, uh, they basically take those neutrons, uh, feed them into this building here, and then split them off into something like 10 or 20 different um, experimental stations. Um, that you can use. So this whole area, when we first started going there, was was um, pretty high security. Uh, it was what was it, 2003? I think was the first time I went there, and um, 2004. Um, pretty soon after 9/11, and and they were just you know uh, when you have a fission reactor, it's uh, um, they tend to get tend to make people nervous. So the security is pretty high. Um, the um, you know, so I'll give you a, quite a few more details on on how to. On, on experiments and things like that. If you're interested in doing something in, in doing um, experiments at a place like this, the website, the NIST uh, NCNR website is, is great. Uh, there's a ton of information on here about obtaining beam time, arranging a visit there. I think they have online schools similar to the, to the school, Julie, that you mentioned at Oak Ridge. And uh, the, the sciences there are just really friendly and, and helpful and, um, and it's, a, it's a great place. 
Um, in terms of a proposal, if, if any of you are interested in, in, in writing a proposal on this, I thought I'd run this through, run through this really fast. Um, so I think there's a call for proposals twice a year. They're relatively easy to get. I think the fund that not the, uh, the, 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 um, acceptance rate or, or beam time, uh, the uh, acceptance rate is something like, I think like 30%. And if you write a good proposal and you know what you're doing, then your, your chances go way up. Um, typically what you do is you'd write a new proposal, uh, for instrument time. Uh, and then you would wait, you know, three, uh, months or something to hear back. Um, and then they, if, if it's accepted, they will allocate beam time to you. You suggest a few dates, but really they make the decision on, on when to give you that beam time. So you have to be ready to, uh, kind of drop everything. And then in two months or a month, go and, and do your experiments, uh, depending on how busy it is. Um, there are also these quick access proposals. So these are, are ones that I think they're likely doing a lot of uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, kind of um, um, accepting a lot of proposals like that. And so these are these are also at times relatively easy to get. And then the third option is a beam time request. And this usually happens if you know each, each beam line has a scientist that's associated with it, one or two scientists. And if you become friends with that scientist, they also have, they have their own internal beam time that's allocated to them. And if you get them interested in your problem, um, your, your scientific problem, they, uh, they'll often um, invite you out there to do um, experiments or even better, you can send them the samples and they'll run them uh, for you, which is awesome. Okay, so that's a little bit about the proposals. I'm happy to tell you more. They're short, they're like two pages to write. Um, but you need to have, you, need, you know, you need to have a compelling problem. You need to show that neutrons are really needed for this problem. And, um, and you need to do like order of magnitude estimates for how long it will take. And, and if you think about your formulation. So I'd mentioned this idea of a neutron scattering length uh, density um, and using deuterated solvents to, to, um, to control that, to control the contrast. NIST has a really nice calculator on their, on their website that uh, you can input your material. So if this was, if you wanted to figure out um, what's the um, neutron scattering length density of a 50-50 mixture of H2O and D2O, um, you put that in here for your material, put in your density, the thickness of your sample cell, hit calculate, and it will give you um, a pretty good estimate of what that uh, scattering length density is. Um, and then, but you're scattering from contrast, so then you need to know what the scattering length density of your silicon oil is. And, um, and, there, and you can work with a beam line scientist to figure out, do I have enough scattering? Do I not have enough? Do I, am I gonna get multiple scattering? Um, and um, so the whole, the whole process is pretty straightforward. So I wouldn't, if you've never done this before, it's not a, um, it's pretty easy to get into. Um, so the, the beam itself, so this is the, uh, the 30 meter small angle neutron scattering instrument at NIST. I think they have two or three uh, ones of different lengths. This, when I first went in there, this is, I mean, it was the coolest experience. It, you feel like you're in like a James Bond movie, um, some like crazy warehouse. There's a lot of high security. There are, you know, a lot of primary colors, you know, painted on the ground where you're allowed to walk, where you're not allowed to walk. Um, this, when we're looking at this here, this is looking back on the, on the reactor back here. Um, the reactor goes in cycles. I think it's like a 38 day cycle. So they, they feed the reactor and, and then they get this uh, decay over 38 days about a month, uh, the, the neutrons are, are fed through this, you know, through, through a variety of optics, uh, wavelength selectors and things like that. Um, your you put your sample in right here. And so there's a variety of computers and then this kind of small area where you can put your sample. And then your, the, so the, the beam comes down here, scatters from your sample, and then is collected in this, uh, in this, uh, this uh, tube or container right here. And then the detector is, is down here. And so because, um, because of the, um, the fact that we, we want to sample really small, well, I'll get into the details of, of Q, but because you're, you're trying to, um, because the, the size goes uh, inversely with Q, um, you want your, if, if you want to access large things that are relatively large, you know, hundreds of nanometers, you need to move your detector as far away as possible. Um, and so your detector, it's unlike a lot of light scattering setups, your detector is actually quite far away from your, um, from your sample, from what you're scattering. Um, there are some more details in here. These are not all that important. Um, you know, the, the, the size regime that you can look at, you can look at things that are between one nanometer to, they say 700 nanometers here. 
that's actually quite hard. You know, get going from, you know, five nanometers to maybe 200 nanometers is a, um, is a reasonable uh, range. And so there are a lot of really cool systems that you can look at um, in, you know, in the size range. One is vi one kind of relevant one right now is viruses. So uh, looking at how uh, we spent some time, which I'm, I'm not going to talk about this here, but we spent some time looking at viral assembly um, and, and how the capsid proteins assemble on um, a, uh, a plant virus, CCMV. I imagine people, a lot of people are studying uh, SARS-CoV-2 now and, and looking at problems like that, but those are right in that, in that size range. Um, in terms of lodging, when you, when you go there, um, you're not going to sleep too much. Um, if you go there, they'll give you a day or two or maybe three if you're really lucky, if you're near the end of the, um, of the, of the reaction cycle and the, and the neutrons are kind of tailing off, they might give you an extra day. You know, typically the first day I would sleep like six hours, the next day I'd sleep maybe three hours, and then the last night you don't sleep, you don't sleep at all. Um, so you, so you find lodging that's incredibly cheap. There's a, a great motel sex right across the street. Uh, there is a, uh, a, a train that goes right behind this motel sex. I think it's like 50 bucks a night to sleep here. You always want to get rooms on the side away from the train, and then you're not going to sleep there much anyway. Um, but um, there's a lot of options like that. Um, is there a question? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yep. Uh, Jim, this is Barkan. I was wondering, so you can also uh, image the viruses by using electron microscopy. Why would you prefer to do neutron scattering uh, over electron microscopy, which is much more available, right? I mean, I, you know, I totally agree with you. I think I, I would say 20 years ago, 15 years ago, even five years ago, the, the technologies for electron microscopy were not as developed. And with these, you know, these crazy sensitive detectors now, um, you can, I mean, you can, you can get so much information out about, um, about, you know, virus, uh, the virus capsid and things like that. Um, it's, a, you know, if you want to look at things like dynamics, I think that electron microscopy is harder. Uh, there are techniques for doing that. But if you want to look at, for example, how the assembly of the, of the capsid proteins and things like that, um, it might be harder, um, but I agree with you. I mean, I, I think um, microscopy methods are, are getting better and better, so. I gotcha, so you, you're saying that, that this, the, there's a, is it because of the size, uh, um, the scale uh, limitations of the electron microscopy that you can't, you can't look at those uh, capsids or is there something else that I'm missing? I mean, I think you can, I'm not an expert in this area, but I think you can, um, um, I think the size is okay. I think it's the, it's more, uh, you know, imaging a hydrated sample. Um, oh, okay. And, you know, having good enough signals and noise to capture the, the, the motion of those, of those capsid proteins. Um, but I know they're getting better and better. So, um, and I love microscopy. So that's. Gotcha. But, Thank you. Okay, so um, in terms, so once you, so you, when you when you start to collect your data, so this is um, a, you get a two D scattering pattern like this, um, and and you'll have you know correlation peaks and things that you see. If it's a you know if it was a if it was a crystalline pattern, you would get Bragg peaks the way that you're that you learn about in in um, kind of in in undergrad chemistry. Um, the, in this case, this is not a um, this is not a crystalline uh, this is an amorphous sample. So there you have a um, a ring, so there's no azimuthal, there's no specific spots in your, um, as you, if you were to sector average and azimuthally. Um, so, so you take that data and, and so you take this 2D scattering data um, and then you azimuthally average it typically, if you have a sample that is, um, is, is the same along all azimuthal angles and you end up getting um, I of Q. So this is the intensity as a function of Q um, and then you, you plot this as a function of Q and you get this 1D plot. So you, you, it's called reducing the data. So you get your data reduced. And this now is what you see here. So this particular 2D plot is not from this. I just grabbed two from two different presentations. But, you know, this, this peak right here would show up as a peak like this in your, in your sample or in your, in your 1D plot. Um, doing that is, is uh, really easy. 
Um, there's there are software programs that are written um, in uh, you can use Igor Pro that are I mean that that are very easy to use uh, for doing this. You have to run a variety of controls, um, but the but the Beamline scientists will help you with that with that uh, data analysis. Um, so the so the experiment that we that I wanted to tell you about in um, with that background uh, involves uh, nano emulsion gelation, and so the idea here was that we had nano emulsion particles that are so these are uh, really tiny oil drops, you know, uh, fifty nanometers in diameter, that are suspended in in water. Um, they're moving around due to due to Brownian motion. But if you have a low salt concentration, they're not going to stick together. They, they'll, they'll behave like individual um, individual particles. And then you can add salt and actually get these to form a gel. And we wanted to, the story I want to tell you is about is about understanding how using small angle neutron scattering to understand how we form that gel. Um, the neat thing about our system was that we could take, we could add salt, we could form a gel, and then um, we could use temperature. We could heat it up, um, and the, the part of the gel would fall apart. And then we could, there was a really um, critical transition temperature between uh, 45 degrees C and 50. And when you went from 50 to 45 degrees C, you would go from a dispersed system to a gelled system. So we could very quickly turn on an attraction between the particles and uh, form this gel. And that's important because the, the, the time dynamics, you know, the, the time resolution of, the, of SANS is, is uh, you know, usually you can, you can capture snapshots like every, every 30 seconds is kind of the best that you can hope. Um, and so it's not a very, it's not a really fast technique. Um, and so waiting for, waiting for the system to cool and things um, would not be, would not be good. So we figured out this way to, to basically rapidly quench the system and then, and then study the, the, the dynamics of gelation. Um, you might ask, you know, why are we interested in this? Where well, there is a whole field of, 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 um, of physicists and other folks looking at how, um, um, at how, how gels form and um, and how things aggregate. Um, this one I picked in particular. This is diffusion limited cluster aggregation of particles with shear rigid bonds. Um, this is one of the one of the uh, most well known models. And so in this case, if you were to if you take particles, um, you turn on an attraction between them. Uh, monomers will diffuse until they uh, find each other and form dimers. Those dimers will diffuse until they form tetramers. Uh, I mean, it's not as simplistic as this, but you get this. This, this cluster formation, those clusters are diffusing to form um, a larger, uh, larger structures. If your volume fraction is high enough, then you'll form a space uh, bridging network and you'll form a, a, a gel that actually has a mechanical rigidity to it and it can span, uh, um, span the length of your, of your container. Um, this one in particular, these experiments were done on gold particles, um, really tiny gold particles, I think five or 10 nanometers in size. Um, but if you look at one of these at one of these arms, you can see that they um, the particles that stick together um, are sticking together with shear rigid bonds. So when they touch, um, if you were to have three particles that were that that happen to to stick together, um, they couldn't internally rearrange to form a denser cluster, and that's because those bonds are shear rigid. In the case of you know gold particles, the actual the bare the bare surface of the gold is touching. And the van der Waals attraction is so large that you actually get a neck that forms between uh, the gold particles. And so this whole thing is effectively a solid piece of gold now once it's aggregated. And so it's clear why this, why you could get, how you could, how you could get a, a shear rigid gel from shear rigid bonds. Um, but what's less clear was how do you, you know, if you have uh, drops and you um, have those drops aggregate, they're not forming shear rigid bonds. They can they can slip around each other, and what's been observed is is that um, you can get you can get shear rigid gels from these slippery bonds. So the question is, how does that happen? How do you get the shear rigid gel? If why doesn't the whole thing just collapse on itself and form you know one really dense um, um, cluster? So um, this is the the problem that we are that we are studying, um, and so. The, the experiments that we did, this is a, um, um, a series of um, I of Q, intensity of Q as a function of Q um, for a system where we were quenching it. So we took, um, initially had, this was at 50 degrees C. These are, these are drops that are um, dispersed. And this is a, called the drop form factor. So there's no, 
uh, structural information from the drops uh, uh, sticking to each other. And when we quench the temperature at high salt, we basically saw that, so this is time moving down here. We saw that this, that this shoulder in our, um, in our form factor dropped. Um, we saw the emergence of a nearest neighbor correlation peak, which is right here. Um, and so this means that there are uh, drops are sticking to one another. And then we saw the, the formation of this, the growth of um, scattering at, at low Q. Um, low Q is large size, right? Um, and so this is the, like the large fractal structure of that, um, of the gel as it formed. Um, just to, to, to remind you the, um, you know, Q, um, go, the, the, uh, the length scale and Q are, are inversely related. And, um, and so if you were to look at like that nearest, that, that peak right there, and you were to calculate, you were asked, what's the, you know, what's the length scale associated with that? It's basically, uh, the diameter of a drop. So this is the, you know, this is two drops that are, where their surfaces are touching, um, and they're actually stuck together. Um, and then this is a higher order uh, uh, peak from that same from that same uh, um, drop drop um, nearest neighbor correlation. Um, one thing that I that I haven't mentioned is that you know when you when we, when you do something like this, so um, your intensity is a combination of uh, what's called a form factor and a structure factor. So the form factor would be if you had particles that were in the really dilute limit, and um, and you're just scattering from the structure of those drops. Um, the structure factor is that it is the information of once the system starts to um, stick together, you get scattering features from the structure that forms. And so in our experiments, what we wanted to do was pull these apart and we wanted to look just at the structure factor and understand how, look at the structural evolution of this, of this gel. Um, and so the way you do this is you basically just, um, uh, just solve for your structure factor. You divide your intensity, your I of Q by uh, form factor and you get S of Q. Um, and that's what this looks like. So this is now just uh, structural information. Um, so S of Q is a function of Q. Again, um, um, small things here, big things here. Um, and so again, this is um, that, that nearest neighbor correlation peak right there is drops touching. Um, this uh, at low Q, this is the fractal gel structure that forms. Whoop. Yeah. And then, um, and then this uh, right here in the center, this minima is is, is representative of uh, the change in your um, uh, in scattering from the surfaces of your individual drops. So as a system aggregates, you'd expect as they start to aggregate, you'd expect to see this emerge. Your drops start to touch. You start to get less scattering from the surfaces of individual drops because some of the surfaces are buried inside your gel uh, structure. Um, and then you'd expect to see these uh, scattering at larger length scales because of the fractal gel structure. Um, the neat thing as well about, about neutron scattering is that if you're able to go to larger, larger sizes, which is hard, you have to have your detector moved really far away, um, and you were to scatter from this gel, you would get um, a nice um, power law right here. Um, and the slope of that power law is your fractal dimension um, for a gel. So you can get out things like fractal dimensions from, um, from scattering. So the, um, just to uh, describe again, so this is, we're gonna call this um, um, S sub L for low Q, S sub min for, um, for the uh, intensity at this minima, and then um, the correlation minima. Um, and so, so we can use either, either this or this, this is a better uh, measure of, of drops and their nearest neighbors um, touching each other. Um, and so if we plot these, those structural features as a function of time, what we saw was that, um, so for our low Q, these are the surfaces of the gel that um, aggregate and are growing. We see this growth. So we get a growth of a, of a large gel structure at length scale starting at 200 nanometers and beyond. Um, you, at mid Q, you have this uh, reduction um, in this S sub N. So you have basically less scattering from the surfaces of indi individual drops because they're being buried beneath um, within this gel. Um, and then at high Q, you have these local correlations between neighboring drops. And the really, the neat thing that we saw was essentially that you have um, the onset of these, this high Q um, local correlations is much sooner than, um, than these other two uh, features. And so what that means is that you, you're forming 
um, your, your cluster, you're forming dense clusters before you form this larger structure. Um, this was really striking, and I didn't include this in this presentation. Typically, you don't see in a, in a system like, um, sorry, in a system like this, you would have a really weak nearest neighbor correlation peak because on average, your particles only have, you know, one nearest neighbor, maybe two nearest neighbors. So, that, so the number of nearest neighbors um, is small here and you typically don't get scattering from it. In our case, uh, we saw a really strong peak. Um, that peak is hard to quantify, but it means that there's a large number of nearest neighbor um, um, nearest neighbors um, than, in, than in a typical uh, aggregation system. And so, um, and so what this is all consistent with is a, um, is a model that we call, ended up calling slippery diffusion limited cluster aggregation, so slippery DLCA. And the idea, so the, getting at the question of how do you form a shear rigid gel from slippery drops, what we see is that um, you have two particles. These particles um, combine to form a dimer. Um, those particles are stuck in a, in a, in a um, they form an attractive bond that is, that is much stronger than KT, so they can't come apart, but they can slip around each other. So, they, so that, that dumbbell can, those two particles can slip around each other. As you add a third particle to this now, now you form a trimer, that system can actually also internally rearrange. Um, and so, for example, this this little drop here can move around the dumbbell, the the around the axis that's formed by um, by, by the by two other particles, and and same with these other other particles. So this system can still rearrange, but as you're adding more and more particles to the system, you are um, reducing the the um, degrees of freedom um, that you have within that cluster. And when you add a fourth particle and you form a tetramer, this is where you can this is the the, the smallest a dense cluster um, where you have no internal rearrangement. So if you think, for example, this particle here, what it would take for this part of this cluster to rearrange, if you were to move this particle around the corner here be onto the other side of this trimer, you would need to break three bonds. Um, and if each of those bonds is much stronger than KT, um, it would be very hard to, to actually break those bonds. And so what you have is this emergence of a, of a tetramer, which is now the fundamental building block of your, of your system. So even though it's made out of slippery bonds, that internal dense cluster cannot rearrange. And that internal dense cluster then forms the foundation of your, um, of your gel. So if you're then to take two tetramers and you were to click these together, those two systems, even though they're or two, two modular building blocks, even though they are, um, you know, the bonds are all slippery, they cannot rearrange, they interlock and they can't rearrange. And so you form, end up forming, um, you know, these larger structures that are built from these um, smaller dense clusters. Um, okay, so that, uh, um, so this is published um, in PRL, um, if you're interested in actually reading the paper. And um, that is all I have. I went much faster than I expected, but uh, we have time for questions.